Hey everyone, welcome to the Podcast Expansion Network, your go-to destination for insider tips and success stories and podcast growth. I'm your host, Victor Dwyer, and today we have a special guest, Matt Kundal. Matt has played a key role in several platforms of radio, TV, online, even movies, and e-learning since the 90s. In 2022, he impressively wrapped up 800 projects in the world of podcasting. Hey Matt, thank you so much for joining today. Please tell the audience that haven't heard of you yet about what you do and a little intro about yourself. Love to hear more about it. So actually I was a radio broadcaster for 25 years and then that came to a screeching halt and an end as I was restructured out. Kind of looked at what I was going to do and you know I'd been a voice actor so I continued that part of my career and in 2015 launched a podcast company after I started my own podcast and since then I've been building podcasts for entrepreneurs, for business people and for performers trying to grow their audience one way or another. And it's it's one thing that I, you know, spent 25 years doing in radio and that was growing audience. So I thought, you know what? I've been around microphones and sound and audio my whole life. I'm going to do this for podcasters now. Yeah, that's awesome. And what kind of got you interested in the podcasting world specifically? I, like there's obviously a lot of avenues you could have gone from broadcasting to anything else. Why podcasting? It's the microphones. I think the first thing I missed when I wasn't around a microphone all day was I built a studio. I got a microphone, at least so I could continue the voiceover business. So I can continue voicing commercials, you know, voicing ads. I'm actually a character on a cartoon series for a while as well. Oh, that's awesome. I got to continue doing that. And then, you know, the podcast movement was taking place in Chicago in 2016. I said, I'm going to go check this out. First thing I did was I started a podcast, made a bunch of mistakes and said, well, I'm going to go learn about this. And I watched and learned and I thought, oh, you know, and this is the Canadian in me. This is like pond hockey. I can skate and stick handle as good as anybody in this room. I don't know where the goal is, and, but when I find the net, I'm going to take a shot and hopefully I'll score. So, and it really was a great sort of buzz and excited and people, it was a very warm and welcoming space, a lot more so than radio, which is very cutthroat and, and very territorial, a lot of gatekeeping that goes on there. I found podcasting to be open and wide and everybody answered my questions. It was so warm. I think I'd like to spend some time here. Yeah, I totally agree. And then while you were going through that process of setting up your podcast and setting up these new audiences and things like that, what is your one piece? of advice that you would give to someone that's trying to start a podcast what would be that be that one piece of advice starting a new podcast with a new audience new everything what would be that one piece of advice? Do your homework. Do lots of homework before you start because there's a lot of little things that can go wrong before you get started. So we'll give you an example. And that's the title of the show. So you want to get together and start a show. Oh, let's call it Real Talk or let's call it Matt Unfiltered. Well, there's a lot of real talks out there. There's hundreds of podcasts with the word real talk in them. There's lots of podcasts with the word unfiltered in there. I don't know how you're going to separate yourself from that. What is your show about? You know, a lot of people don't even know what their show is going to be about. Well, I think I'll just try it. Well, that's okay. You can go try it, but you certainly can't expect to build an audience unless you can tell people directly what the show is about. Titling is just so key. The other thing is the sound. And I hate to get technical geeky on people, but here we are in 2024. We are still messing this up. There are people who are blowing through all the stop signs when it comes to the tech part of it, about the type of microphone you need. And I know it's very much me on my high horse telling you what to get, but the Blue Yeti is not a good microphone. That is not helpful. You don't want to have like sound with echo. You want to really think about where are you going to be recording? Who are you going to be recording with? What is the space going to be like? Are there going to be dogs nearby? Because if the dog starts barking in the middle of your podcast, you're now going to have to give them credit to be on the show and probably pay the dog in order to be a part of the show. Is it an echoey room? Is yeah. it a place where the phone is going to ring? Are you going to be interrupted? These are the things that yeah, you really have to think about. How are we going to make a nice recording? And then after that, how are we going to make it sound good? Is there somebody who's going to be able to help you with that? Is there somebody who can make it great? Because what you're really trying to do is you're really trying to create a really nice audio experience for people to listen to. And I understand what you're saying. I know people are yelling and saying, well, it's really about the content and how great it is. Well, your content's going to be so-so because here's the thing you need to know about podcasting. Your first five episodes are going to suck. There's just no way around it. You're finding, you know, it's like the first time you cook it. Well, I want to make spaghetti bolognese. Well, the first couple of times you make it, it's not perfect. It's not exactly exactly the way you want. It takes a couple of tries for you to get it tasting the same, the way that you remembered it or the way somebody else served it, that great Italian spot up the street. So be patient with yourself. Give yourself the first five episodes for them to suck. Give yourself the first 20 episodes before you even start thinking about, oh, maybe I should be marketing this a different way or a better way. And how are you going to tell people about this show? So there is a lot to consider going in. I think it's important to be patient with yourself, allow yourself to make mistakes, but definitely do some homework because I find a lot of people 
people get to episode six and they realize they want to change their show from real talk to the basket weaving podcast. <laughs> yeah. And what I was doing, I was looking for this, our one strategy deck that we've done before. And this can, what I wanted to share was how in depth with the research you can go into. And that's what I was looking for in the back end here. And I finally found it. So this is one that we did for a client and I'm just showing this, I'm sharing my screen here to show this, that this is something that how in depth you can really get into, meaning that you can do the audience research of the exact person you're trying to target. And then from there, you can really go into like, what do you want the format to be like? What do you want the segments to be in there? How do you like, how, what's the overall like pitch of what you're looking for? And then from there you can figure out, okay, who's going to be the host? Uh, how is that dynamic going to work between the host and things like that? And then you can figure out, okay, what are we going to name it? What is the particular direction that we want to go in? And then you can also, to your point of like, this is another way of the format and also doing your research of what are other people doing? Like, what does their format look like? And then at that point, really figuring out, okay, this is the format that's working for them. Okay, cool. How can I make a unique version of this? So it's important to not only see, okay, what is everyone else doing? But now how do I make a unique version of this? That's also going to be successful. And so this is the extent you could go into of like how much you do the market research on the back. And now I don't expect everyone in the world to do this, but this is a foundation that you could possibly follow to find something that works for you. Matt, what are your thoughts on that? So let's say you are going to be doing a podcast. You know, you, you mentioned cancer in there. So what are the number two and three most popular podcasts in that spot? Are you going to be able to, to run with them? Are you going to be able to fit in with them? And are you going to have things in common? I think that's okay. You know, just to have a little, just to be, can you be as good as the leaders in that spot? I look at it to a hockey game. I'm going to go back to hockey. Yeah. And, you know, I was never really worried about the score of the game until about the last five minutes. If we're down by one or two, I said, can we get the next one to make it four, three? Because I'll pull the goalie. And then we'll we'll put the extra attacker out and we'll tie the game and we'll be okay. So as long as you're close, you're always within striking distance of really where you want to be. The other thing is those podcasts that you think you're in competition with are actually your best friends. So True. work with them, appear on their shows. Maybe you want to do a promo swap with them. One of the other slides you blew by, which I really, really love, where you talked about this is going to be a podcast about a duo. And this is what I you know, did in radio and, and mm -hmm. was pretty good at. And that was role definition. So you're going to yeah. put two people on the podcast. What if you both sound the same? How are people going to be able to tell the difference between you? Yeah. Let's not, and first of all, let's never assume that people are going to watch it and I'm going to be on YouTube and I don't really care about the audio because the audio is going to get you a lot of listens. So you do have to separate it. So let's say even if you do sound the same, let's talk a little bit about role definition. What is the difference? What does Victor bring to the show and what does Sylvie bring to the show that is going to separate it? And can Victor support Sylvie? So Sylvie is going to be specializing in medication A. So Victor needs to support that. Sylvie, you're a specialist when it comes to medication A. Would this be something we'd like to use at this particular time with this patient? You have to support people in that way. These are techniques that, you know, for radio stations and morning shows to cut through the clutter in a 15 station market with everybody on the air at the same time. But this is still something that you can do in podcasting to really sort of forwards people, everybody's role definition on the show. And it's, it's again, one of the little things that people blow by because they think, ah, oh, we don't need to worry about that. It's something you should think about when you, when, and by the way, you really need this if you have three. And if you're going to do a podcast with four, I would not do that podcast. You can throw that one in the garbage. That is too many people. <laughs> Yes. Makes the dynamic very, very difficult when you have that many people on. I, I totally well, how's, How can you tell the difference between anyone that you're putting a huge onus on the listener to understand who is talking at a particular time? And you know, you also have to force people, hey, Matt, what do you think? You have to actually address people by name, but a lot of people don't do that. They just blow through all that stuff and assume that everybody's going to know everything about what's going on all the time. And if people did that, they wouldn't need podcasts. True. They would know everything all the time. We wouldn't be solving any of their problems. And going to the problems point, what is your, how do you really provide value? Like, what do you look at in the audience to say, hey, this is how I'm going to provide value to that audience. Going to that research point, what do you really do to do that value input and do that value research to make sure you're actually adding value to the audience? Okay. So that's an interesting question. So, well, that first of all, starts with good audio. Secondly, yeah. it comes from good editing. I took a podcast today. I took it from 35 minutes down to 28. Ums, ahs, all that thing. It's just, you have to cut this stuff down and really you can save these minutes. I say, I mean, if, let's say there's a thousand downloads on this podcast and I, I saved the earth 7,000 minutes today 
you know, from this one podcast where people were, I mean, this is a tough podcast because it involved comedy, but people are trying to think of the jokes and they're trying to think of stuff. And I'm just simply cutting out some of the thoughts, you know, the brain farts, the burps, the likes, the you knows. And I'm not here to make it sound like a difficult listen in the end where it's all sort of condensed. It's still going to be a nice free flowing conversation, but we need to remove the useless words. And there are tools to do that. I'm sure Descript is a good tool that a lot of people like to use. I don't use it. I like to do it. I like to edit to my ear, but yeah, saving time and minutes and making a nice listening experience experience, taking out the background noise if possible, leveling it so that if a dynamic ad were to come in, it's still even keeping it level so that they can listen to it on CarPlay, a nice headphone listening experience. You know, minus 14 luffs is what Spotify wants. Minus 16 luffs is what Apple wants. Let's try to adhere to those numbers. Yeah, I love that. And then how do you provide content or how do you provide value? Not on necessarily the research standpoint, but more of the content standpoint of like saying, hey, this is something that people are actually going to be interested in rather than just doing a real talk show, a real talk podcast show and just like spit in the crap. Like, how do you actually make sure that this is going to be something valuable to other people? What is your methodology for that? I think that comes from the conversation of talking out. Some people, I actually spend time talking people out of doing a podcast because maybe you're better off becoming a professional guest and going and just appearing on some of the podcasts in the space to do that and bring your value in that sense. I think the hard part is connecting people to the podcast. We don't have a discoverability problem in podcasting. Your podcast might have a discoverability problem. And if you're just like shooting it out there, on the socials every week and it's a basket weaving podcast. I don't think anybody on Twitter is going to care, but you can go to the places maybe where basket weaving is done and maybe pass out some cards and maybe get into the basket weaving magazine, offer up a little bit of contra to tell people about the magazine while they give you an ad in the magazine. There's lots of things you can do to get. It's really about going out and finding and building your community of who's out there. It's not really about littering the internet with reels and social media posts and Twitter bombing and all that stuff and Instagram. It's that's nice for the people who follow you. But if you don't have hundreds of basket weavers following you on Instagram, it's really going to be wasted. You're going to get ones and twos, maybe. And somehow you activated my Alexa. I have no idea how. So she was going crazy in the background there. So <laughs> it must be the Canadian accent. Yeah, <laughs> she's not used to it, I guess. But yeah, I wanted to ask you about the ways you grow your podcast. So some people will do it through social media and posting the clips there. What is your methodology to really help grow the podcast and really get more traction there? Yeah, so it's lonely when you start because your first episode is going to have nine downloads. Everybody starts at zero and everybody seems to get nine downloads on the first day and we don't really know where they come from and that's what you're stuck with. From there though, you do have to do a little bit of social media try. So you're going to try a little bit on Facebook. You'll try a little bit on Twitter. You're going to definitely try on Instagram. You will go and you've got to tell people about it. You got to tell your family about it first. They're all going to give you five-star reviews because they love you. Um, but really it, after that, there's a lot of trying. And that's why I say you got to be kind to yourself. Mm -hmm. You've got to reach out to the right people that you think are going to like this show and you've got to ask them to try it. And then after that, there's a lot of word of mouth that takes place. I would also be very, very careful about what I call the doggy commands. I know we're desperate to get going. I know we're desperate to have this thing go, but you're building it. You're not going to have any hockey stick growth or rocket ship growth that goes to the moon. You're not getting to a thousand downloads necessarily after a few days. You may not even get there after a few years. However, Asking your audience over and over again for ratings and reviews, asking them over and over again for things that may not move the needle. Be careful how many times you ask your audience for things. I call those doggy commands. And radio is a terrible, terrible place for it. Because if you listen to the radios, radio station, any radio station these days, what do they say? Be there. Call now. You know, be the first one through to win. Everything is they're telling you what to do all the time. Text us now. It's a lot. And it's not really the real, if you and I, you know, we're friends and I'm bossing you around at that level, we're not going to be friends for very long. So be very careful about your calls to action, how many times you're doing it and make sure that you're asking for something that's really, really useful. Asking for ratings and reviews in the first minute of your show before you've really offered up anything in episode one is probably not the right thing to do. That's a good point. <laughs> I went up to you right away and I said, oh, hey, by the way, give me a rating and review. I was like, I'm sorry, who are you? <laughs> you want? Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, that's really good. And then anything else, like any other tips, like social media wise, or like it could either be pod, like Spotify, like tip, like platform, like podcast platform 
tips itself or social media tips to help grow the podcast. Do you have anything there insight wise? Yeah, get a website. Absolutely get a website, get your website, get your own.com where it can be your home. And on your website, you should have the badges that are popular. Apple and Spotify are always very popular. Those are the two big ones. You may want to look at a third one, maybe perhaps like Amazon that might come to mind. I'm not a big fan of telling people to go to YouTube for the podcast. I think people will search and find it, but make sure you're searchable on YouTube and do make sure that your podcast is on YouTube like this one is because YouTube is the world's biggest search engine. From there, people will be like, you know, I don't have the time to watch what Matt has to say all the time here on YouTube, but it's nice to know I can go into Apple, Spotify, or my favorite podcast app to go and, and catch the full sh in my ears at a later time. One thing that I do like about Spotify is the ability to share from Spotify into my Instagram. If you go to your episode and then you go to you hit the square to go share it, it will pop up in your stories. And from there, you can tag the people who are in there. It's really, really easy. And then for the users, just one click to go listen to it. That's really the only time I make a suggestion oh, to send people directly to a podcast platform. The rest of the time, make sure that your episode has its own page on your website and that your podcast player is up there where people can, can listen to it. And I'm not saying people are going to listen to it at the computer generally about 3%, maybe 4% on a good day, you know, we'll take in your show using, you know, the app or a desktop on the website. But the point of this is that you have a home that is searchable on the web, that the basket weaving podcast has its own home homepage and Google can find it. This is really about search because I find if you send people to Facebook for something, you're going to get stuck watching cat videos. If you send people, you know, to Apple podcasts, you're going to start listening to smartless all of a sudden. If you go to Spotify, now you're into caller daddy because those are the things that pop up once you get into that ecosystem. So if you're going to send people anywhere, please send them to your website. Make sure your website is your home base to your show. I think it's worth 20% of the audience marks. Wow. That's incredible. That's huge. Do you ever do, it is. Uh, do, when you send them to your website, do you either capture their email to get them on a newsletter? What's your methodology of getting them on the website? Well, anytime you do a social media link, it goes to your website. So make sure that all the clicks go there. Always send them there. On the website, what do you want to do with them? If you want to capture their emails because you have a newsletter, Newsletter? Absolutely. Capture their email. Make sure there's an offering though with the newsletter. You don't want to send people out just like, oh, by the way, here's the newsletter. I'm going to tell you when my favorite episode is. Because just asking people to hit follow or subscribe on your podcast app is going to do that job for you. But what is in the newsletter that's going to be really, really useful for people? What do people really want? They want something that's useful. So if you're going to have a newsletter and you're going to ask for their email address, be sure to give them something useful in return. So if you sign up for my newsletter, what can you offer that is going to be helpful. I know for, for instance, a health website, they offer me a free dosha quiz where I can just take a quick quiz. I'll sign up and then they'll tell me a little bit about my body. Sometimes it could be a monthly draw for a gift card. Sometimes it could be the top 10 tips for good headphone usage or the top 10 microphones I like to use that's not named the Blue Yeti. It could be any one of those things, but at least offer something in return if you're going to ask people for an email. Yeah, I totally agree. Do you have any other insights of abilities to grow podcasts? Is there any other tips that you would have that you, we haven't mentioned yet? Yeah, consistency. You really do need to be consistent with your show releases. Now, I just had somebody on a podcast this, that disproved that whole theory, but what you didn't know is that they were marketing all the time. They remained active on social media. So people stayed engaged and there was still a way to keep in contact with this person. But so often people are like, well, I'm going to call this the end of season one and I'll be back with season two at a later time. And uh, yeah, I'm going to enjoy my break. And you, they've disconnected from their audience. They haven't done anything. They haven't put out any newsletters. They didn't put out any social media. And then they come back and their audience is cut in half. Well, yeah, because you, you disengage. But if you're going to release episodes, do it consistently when people know it's going to happen. I don't know what your favorite TV show was growing up. Mine was, I'm going to age myself here. It, well, it was okay. But you know, every time when SpongeBob is on, you kn knew what time it was. It was consistently there every time in a particular day. And so were you. And you were there and ready to go, ready to receive the show. For me, it was like the love boat on ABC, followed by Fantasy Island. That was Saturday night. And every Saturday night at eight o'clock, I could watch that show. And your favorite morning radio show starts at 5.30 a.m. And you know what they're doing at eight o'clock and they're going to play the fun game at 8.15. All those little benchmarks are things the way that you would train people to listen to. So do the same with your podcast. Release it at a time that is consistent when people, when you become part of their work week, you become part of their media consumption week. I don't want to get in and talk about the frequency and whether or not you should do it every week or every two weeks or every month. That's I believe that's really up to you. But you know there is an advantage to doing something every week because you do become part of people's media week. And if releasing consistently, there's an expectation that can be met. 
and I think that really does pay dividends. Again, that's worth another 20% of the marks. Yeah. And while you were setting up the podcast, is there any failures that you went through that are worth mentioning to the audience here? My podcast? Yeah. Yes. Correct. Well, I hope you have another half hour because I made so many mistakes. <laughs> Unbelievable how many mistakes mm -hmm. I made. So I started back at 2015, I mentioned. And the first mistake I made was I put the show on SoundCloud. And SoundCloud is not a podcast host. It's for music. And if you're putting your podcast up on SoundCloud today, well, they haven't supported any Apple category since 2018. It's not up to date. It's full of bots. The metrics are terrible. It's not a good place to have your podcast. So I got out of there as quickly as possible. Possible. Make sure you get a you know a good podcast host that's going to work for you. There's a lot of great ones out there. Another mistake I made was the sound. The sound was too much like radio. It was really loud. It was you know I was talking at people instead of to people. I didn't create a headphone experience. It was I kind of thought it was like a rock radio station, like you know KLOL in Houston or the you know I guess what was the Eagle in Dallas and you know, loud and Sammy Hagar and big, loud Led Zeppelin music. That's not what podcasting's about. It's more intimate. It's more conversational. It's more one-on-one. -on -one. I needed to really hone and fix that early on. And then I think for me, there was one other little thing I learned that I needed to do. And it, this is a little bit technical. And that's, I had a Canadian advertiser come on board and I thought, great. And then I felt bad for my American portion of the audience. It was like, well, they can't buy this. And I think for many Canadians who listen to podcasts and they get you know, sold U.S. stamps. Well, Canadians don't need U.S. stamps. So in the end, I wound up working with a podcast host that does dynamic audio insertion, and I could just run my Canadian ads in Canada, and I could run my American ads in the States. And I thought, again, that was a great way to take care of the audience. And at the same time, for me to get paid twice on a mid-roll ad during a show. So as the show has gone on, we correct our mistakes as we go. And you know, I think we evolve. And one of the things that, that I've evolved is I've just started to do video like you're doing, and you and I are talking on video right now. We use Squadcast for that. But now we're we're repurposing the video. We're using reels, which are a little bit more popular now. And you know, it used to be more audiograms, but now I'm trying reels. And I think I've said a lot of things here and I've given a lot of crazy podcast wizardry advice. But I think the thing that's most important is that you try, try and just try it and see if it works for you. And I think trying is the greatest thing you can do. I mean, should I start a podcast? Yes, of course you should. And you can start your podcast tomorrow called Real Talk if you have to, but at least you've started the audio process of the thing. You got the title, <laughs> but you know, You've started the process of getting some audio down and listening back to it. And can you create a nice listening experience? Yeah, I love that. And then what do you believe that podcasts, how podcasts are different from every other media outlet that you've done in the past with your radio hosting and everything else? I know you went to that a little bit, but what really sets podcasting apart from every other media out there? I'm curious. The thoughts. intimacy. Yeah, it's the intimacy. And so I'll give you the voiceover example more than anything. And that's, there are commercials that get made every day for TV, for radio, for streaming, for the Google machine and, and the Amazon machine that's been talking to us already today. And they are, it's a different read. It's loud. But when it comes to the podcast one, it's got to be more of a headphones built in and you know, a warm announcer read built for the head. It's not the same read. You can't take your radio ad and put it into podcasting. And so with that, how is podcasting even different from radio? Well, radio is live and local. And now podcasting, the content can be evergreen. I have episodes that get listened to three and four years after the fact they've been created. So I look at, you know, podcasting being more of an on-demand Netflix kind of experience and radio is more of live events now kind of experience. Yeah, I love that. And then any other advice that you would give to someone that's very, very new to podcasting and what would be another piece of advice that you would give them knowing what you know now going into the podcasting world? Yeah, do your homework and ask around. You know, the same way when I jumped into this in 2016 and everybody was very helpful and warm and wonderful, podcasters are nice. They will help you come up with the right answer. And if they can't give you the answer, hopefully they will connect you with somebody who can provide the right answer. So sometimes you can go into, you know, I recommend the podcast movement community. There's like 80,000 people in there. Not everyone's going to give you the right answer, but if you scroll through all the answers, you'll eventually know who, you know, where and who will deliver you the right answer, but the right type of microphone you might be able to use. Try to give as much detail about what you want out of your show. Like, where are you going to be hosting it? Who's like, do you want to record it here and there? Ask for help with this stuff because we're doing all this at home alone. It can get very lonely. So use the online news groups to your 
advantage to help land on the answers that you want to to get you started. And if you want to know how helpful it is, just go into the news group and suggest, I'm going to start a new podcast called Real Talk or Unfiltered Real Talk. Is this a good idea? And I think <laughs> some people will probably say that you should probably, you know, find, you know, a podcast that's got a better title than that. You know, and if it's one thing, like, what's your end goal? I think when it comes to a podcast title, is it searchable? You know, so get something that's searchable. And then in terms of like the content, is this recommendable? Is Have I created something that people will be able to recommend to other people? Is this a recommendable experience? And that really should be your goal. Don't worry about the downloads and everything else. Just be comfortable with your subject matter. And is this recommendable? I usually tell people that they need to be curious about the subject. So it's a balance of both where they have to be curious and have some level of interest about the podcast. Let's say it's basket weaving. They have to have some level of interest and basket weaving first. And then you're going to be interested in the subject to actually be consistent so that way you can actually build an audience. So I usually say start with the interest, figure out what you're curious about, create a podcast on that, and then you can start getting feedback from other people to start getting providing more value. Is usually my methodology there. Anything that you would add on to that? No, I would completely agree. Curiosity is authenticity and authenticity is really what leads to people listening to what you want to do. I mean, I sat here in 2015 and I was like, what am I going to do a podcast about? And then I realized I only know about one thing and I only know about radio. So I guess I'll do it about that. Well, there's already somebody else doing a podcast about radio. And I go, well, I guess I'll make mine as good as that person's, I hope, or at least close. And we'll see where it goes from there. Speak to what you know. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> and then I wanted to ask you, can you share on your thoughts on how to get monetization from a podcast? Do you have any insights that you can share about monetization in a podcast? Yeah. So here's an idea. You just go up to anybody on the street, tell them about your podcast, ask them if they'll listen to it. If they say yes, stick out your hand and demand a dollar. That's my favorite monetization <laughs> strategy. I actually suggested in a news group once That's that, that, if you, that you put their head in the toilet, give them a swirly and flush if they didn't give you the dollar. But apparently that's not legal. Let's monetization. <laughs> it's bizarre because everybody wants to do it. I'm not so sure you necessarily need to. So let's talk about your why about why are you doing a podcast to begin with? You might be finding out that your podcast is a more is an actual marketing venture rather than something that's going to drive revenue. Maybe you're marketing yourself and you're getting some business out of that or you're growing your brand and you're getting money another way rather than saying, well, I'm going to monetize this and we want to get some sponsors and we want to start selling some mattresses. I don't know that that's necessarily the best thing. I think you need to look at your show and have a little faith in it that it's, you know, that you're brand building. I mean, that's my podcast does have ads in it. However, I don't need ads in it. And the ads certainly don't pay for the show outright. It supports it. I can pay a bill or two off it. Maybe I can pay my transcription. Maybe I can pay my video bill off that, off the money I make off the ads. However, I do know one thing that if I stop doing the podcast, my company is going to grind to a halt and we're not talking about audience metrics. And then people aren't thinking about audience metrics. And then no one's going to be coming to me to talk about building their show anymore. So think of it as a car going down the highway. You take your foot off the gas, the car eventually will stop at the side of the road. And that's going to be where your show and your company and your brand sits at that point, kind of broken down at the side of the road. So, but in terms of monetization, so many ways to monetize. Does it have to be ads? No, it could be a partnership. It doesn't have to be money. It could be contra. I gave the example earlier about the basket weaving podcast that was going to, you know, co-promote into the basket weaving magazine where the basket weaving podcast was going to have an ad, but now you have to plug and just say, hey, we're going to take a moment here to thank our supporter, the Basket Weaving Magazine, for uh, all the great things that they do. You should pick up a subscription now. It's partnerships. It's trying, you know, it's a rising tide that yeah. lifts all boats. So I think when we talk about monetization, we expect that we can sit back and get a check in the mail. Well, if you have some programmatic ads, that's not going to be a lot of money. I don't know how many times you want to read about Manscaped in order to make life interesting for people. Some of that <laughs> stuff is just not going to fill your pockets. I think you need to pay attention to what you're selling, to what you have have to offer and to look at your show as an entire marketing vehicle. And I think it's a huge opportunity for businesses to get into the podcasting world as well, because that way they can actually utilize that content and be able to distribute that. You talked about the gas and car scenario, how the podcast is a vehicle for business growth. And I feel like so many businesses aren't posting content. They're not doing anything. No one knows who they are. They get all their business off of referrals, word of mouth. It's just so unpredictable. It just always goes up and down. Whereas you could have a podcast and things like that to scale up your content so that way you're posting consistently and not having work to worry about the next content you're posting and you can put it into reels and everything else and scale it and make it successful that way 
And rather than, and where you can call, always keep that gas on the pedal of your car and that way you're always getting business and have a consistent form of revenue now. So I think that makes a lot more sense rather than just having the referrals. I think it's a huge opportunity for businesses. Yeah. It's, you've already got all the channels anyway. You've got the newsletters, you've got the social media, you know, out there, you've got your audience in front of you. So by doing a podcast and doing a video podcast specifically, whereby you can put it into audio, you can go and repurpose this stuff into your socials where you already have the people who are engaged with your content, who are able to come back and go, yeah, I'm totally engaging just a little bit more now. Cool. Awesome. And is there one thing that we didn't mention that you want to go deeper into? It could about anything about a conversation we have, anything that's top of mind that you kind of want to dive into a little bit more? No, I mean, I think I kind of touched on it earlier. And that's the patience that, that comes with this. It takes three years to build an audience. Mm -hmm. And people say, well, why does it take three years? Well, it's like if you start a radio station, it's going to take people about three years to really find the station, love the station, and then fall in love with it. If it's the same with the morning show, same with the podcasting, it's about really habits. Three years, if you add up 365, you multiply it by three, it goes up over a thousand. It really does take the human more than a thousand times of any action to really learn it. So and that includes listening to your podcast podcast. So over a thousand days engaging with it. So give yourself a chance to grow your first year, let yourself sort of find your way through it. And then second year, find your voice and find, you know, maybe the way it looks and maybe fix the website up a little bit. And then that third year, you can really start to feel things take off because you've stayed consistent and you stay true to your brand and maybe tweaked it along the way. And then after, you know, three years, you're, you should have found exactly what you were looking for. And it may not be exactly what you started. Podcasting is going to be the thing that will change and shape you and your brand. And you didn't expect it. And that's wonderful. Yeah. And after someone listening to this full episode, what's the one actionable step that you want them to take? What's the one key takeaway that you want them to take away from this entire episode? Well, hopefully they, they first of all, got this far because that shows that we're interesting. And I think consumption is really a big <laughs> stat. So I know yeah. we know, I know we pay a lot of attention. Oh, downloads, downloads, downloads. Maybe you should be going into your Apple and taking a look to see how far people are getting through the episodes. Maybe if it's like less than 50%, you need to sort of say to yourself, I'm a little bit boring. This show is too long and we need to cut this down. So congratulations to anybody who made it to the end of this episode. Thank you. I feel very good about the fact that you got this far and continue to listen to what I have to say. It's consumption is a stat that, that people just don't, I think, give enough love to. They don't pay attention to it nearly as much. Yeah, that's the one thing I really hope that they do is they do pay attention to the consumption of the show. So a question about that. If your consumption does suck where people only listen to the first minute and then that's it, what do you do to make it more engaging? Do you add more things to it? Do you like change things up? How do you make things more interesting from a podcast standpoint to have it increase your consumption rate for people to listen to the full episode? Okay. So cut the crap out of the show. You got to find a way to do that. So I think the first thing is you've got to give people a reason in the first 40 seconds to listen to the show. So when you bring the guest on, you give them the reasons why it's important that you listen to this show today with this particular guest. From that, get into it right away. We don't need a lot of discussion about the LinkedIn bio. We don't need a lot of discussion about their history. We don't need a lot of discussion about the things that people can get elsewhere. We want to get to why they're on the show and why people need to listen and just get right to that very point and get into it. A lot of podcasting, the decision is made in the first 37 seconds, you know, whether or not they want to keep listening. So make sure that it's there and upfront. From that, we need to matriculate stuff forward. As a host, I don't think people need too much of my opinion about what I think about something. I try to keep my questions short. I think the best Best interviewers in the world are Dan Patrick, Howard Stern, and Terry Gross. I think all their questions are very, very short and they just want the answer back. I know you're thinking, oh, well, it's not a conversation. It's not conversational. If your questions are short as a host, you're going to get the credit for it. I know this because I interviewed every rock star in North America at one point and I kept it short because I actually didn't know anything. But I just want my job was to only ask the questions that people wanted their favorite artists to answer. And people started coming up to me going, oh, my God, you know so much. You are so smart. You're like the music encyclopedia knowledge man of the earth. Truth was, I just wanted to ask the questions that people wanted to hear one of the bands to answer. That's all. I wasn't, but I got all the credit. And you know what? I'm still doing the same thing today. And I'm getting all the credit as a very smart person in podcasting by putting smart podcasting and broadcasting people on my podcast. And I'm learning and paying attention, of course. But it's somehow, like, you know, the credit, it feels like I'm the beehive of activity for this thing. And I'm not saying I'm a fraud. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying this is where it lives. 
You know, it's like the radio station where rock lives. So this is where the information lives. And that's why people come to this particular spot. So don't think you have to like over talk and make it a full conversation. If there's a conversation, go ahead and have it. But you don't have to give your opinion. I edited a podcast today and it was, you know, it felt like every answer required some sort of like compliment or some extra add on word. Let's go to the next question. Keep the ball matriculating down the field. Keep the interview moving forward. Time. It's time. What is the ask here when you want people to listen to your podcast. It is time. What is your competition for that time? It's all the shit people have to do. They got to get to the grocery store. They got to pay the bills. They got to go to the bank. They got a they got a busy, 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 got a volleyball PTA meeting. And your show, which is 47 minutes long, which could easily be 27 minutes, is wasting their time because you put it out at 47 minutes. So you really got to cut stuff down and think about yeah. whether or not they have the time for this and make it so worth their while. I'm guilty of it. I know I do this. I go one question too long. My consumption rate is somewhere between like 76 and 82%. It could be better. Anything over 70 is great, by the way. But I know I can make that better because I'm probably asking one question too many and I'm not taking it out. Yeah. Thank you for that. Well, Matt, that's all we have time for today. Please tell the audience how to find you, how to find more about you and everything else like that. You can find my entire network at soundoff.network and you can find the show, which is called the Sound Off Podcast, the original that started back in early 2016. It is soundoffpodcast.com where we talk audio, we talk podcast and broadcast all the time. Cool. Awesome. Well, Matt, thank you so much for joining. These were these insights were amazing. Thank you for that. Thank you everyone for listening. Hopefully you did make it this far because you would have like a 99% listen here. Thank you for if you did get to this far. And this is the Podcast Expansion Network. Let us know if you need anything and we'll catch you next time.